and welcome to the Wonder Learn Show. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. In this episode, I have Eric Gilbertson, and he will be talking about his traverse with a kite across Greenland. This is an epic, crazy journey. He was carrying 400 pounds, which is about probably about 180 kilos or something like that, with four sleds. He went with another friend, and also as a guest coming along will be uh, Chris Lee Melisek. She'll appear a little bit later in the podcast. You'll hear her voice. And she will ask some of the questions. If you heard last week's episode with Chris Lee, you will know that she climbed up K2 as or with Eric, not at the same time, but on, on the same uh, season. And also, she's quite an adventure woman herself. And so she's intrigued by this trek across Greenland. And we talk also about trekking across Antarctica and things like that. So enjoy this fabulous episode once again with Eric Gilbertson and Chris Lee Melisek. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this summer I spent about two months. We were uh, traversing Greenland. We made the first southeast northwest traverse. It was like fifteen hundred miles. So we spent forty forty days on the ice cap. We made four first ascents of mountains on the west coast, and apparently no one's done this before. Like kited in as an approach to mountains, <laughs> and it definitely is difficult because the wind is good on the ice cap and it's bad in the mountains. So you mm-hmm. can't just kite to the base. You kind of have to. Man, haul cool. your sleds. Yeah, and we're calling like three to four hundred pounds of gear. We're each dragging four sleds behind us. But wait, didn't you get to those mountains toward the end of the journey? So your lighter would have a lighter load, or no? Or is that the beginning? Yeah, it was a little bit lighter. It was kind of in the middle. We started okay. in um, near this town, Tasilak, is a big town on the southeast. Mm-hmm. So it took um, about two weeks waiting for the sea ice to clear, but we finally made it to the coast, and then. We hauled the four, we started out with 400 pounds of gear. We hauled that up to, for about a week. And each we're, of we're, you had each of you, there was two of you or three, two of us. We each had 400 pounds. Okay. okay. Yes. We brought a lot of extra fuel and food just in case. Yeah. But then once we're finally on the ice cap, then you don't even notice the weight because we have this kite attached to our harness and it's pulling us along. And then we have the sleds in a two by two grid behind us. We're pulling along. Wow. And we can get pulled at like 30 miles an hour. It's super fast. A couple <laughs> like, days, we made 200 miles in a day in like 14 hours. One day, our best was two, 218 miles. It's pretty incredible. It, how much of a physical strain is it? Because you're making it sound like you're just kind of like cruising and the kite just taking you and you're like, you're not even working up a sweat. I mean, but I'm sure it's actually a lot of physical work. No? Or how is how does it? For someone who's never it, kited before, can try to describe it. I would say like calorie expenditure, it's about the same as if you were dragging, maybe even a little bit less than if you're dragging the sleds that distance, but it really wears on your body because there's all these sastrugi on the snow. So it's not just smooth and flat, but these like one or two foot bumps. Like indolating, like, like uh, it's when pieces of ice kind of like become uh, almost vertical. And so you kind of like bounce. Is that, is that a fair description or no? Yeah, there's like little bumps of snow and you get air on them and then the sled's jumping in the air and we call this a strugi massage. You're just like going over rumble strips in a car all day long for 100 miles. Yeah. And like after two hours, you just get sore everywhere. Yeah. The ski boots are sore. The harness is sore. So it's that's the main issue. Then we have to rest for, I don't know, a little, just like 15 minutes and then you don't get sore. So how how does, I mean, like the, does the, I imagine you really got to pack well because with every bump, you've got to, you know, there goes your stove, there goes your Snickers bar. <laughs> there goes Exactly. Your bag. <laughs> well, there's one reason why we, we wanted uh, a two by two grid of sleds instead of one huge sled because it won't flip over. And also we want each, each of us to be completely self-sufficient. So we had two tents, three stoves. Like if I got separated from Brandon or he lost his sleds, then fell in a crevasse or something, we could still survive with everything I had. Nobody fell in a crevasse. No, we didn't have any issues. It was it because you went uh, at the right season, time of year? Uh, we chose a, an entrance point that is well known to have very few crevasses. It's a very gradual slope up to the ice cap. We definitely crossed crevasses, but it wasn't that big of a deal. And once we get high enough elevation, person, right? You didn't see anybody. No, we didn't see. We saw one set of polar bear tracks. That's the the only thing we saw. No, no snow fox or other. 
You see the abominable snowman, the Yeti? We didn't really see any. Uh, on the coast, we would see, like, foxes and... Okay. Mm, yeah, we birds. didn't really see much. Birds oh, it was very... Over? Not even, not even birds. I mean, there's airplanes because it's a popular like Europe, North America route. I kind of mm. wondered if they could see us because this kite's like twenty feet wide mm. by like it's huge. Mm. It's How possible. much do these kites cost? Ah, uh, they're like a couple. If you pay full price, which we didn't, they're like one to two thousand dollars a piece, and we each need three kites. You got if the wind's really low, you want a big kite, mm. so it'll pull you along. If the wind's really high, like 40 knots would be way too high. You want a tiny kite. Mm. So that's a big deal. Like, which kite do we use? We got to switch if the wind changes. So how often in a, di in a day would you switch? On a bad day, we would have to switch maybe like four or five times. But switching can take like 45 minutes. So you don't want to have to switch. Yeah. So on our big days, usually we would just use one kite the whole day. So we mm. could be more efficient. Right. Because, yeah, I mean, if you're taking 45 minutes, you're, you're losing a lot of miles during those 45 minutes just to change over. But you'd have to do it just because you were going too slow at times and other times you're going too fast. Yeah, like sometimes it can rip you off the ground if the wind's too strong. Mm. One time, mm -hmm. like, it was too strong and my kite turned into what I call a kite mare. It just, like, spun and got super tangled. And we knew the wind was going to die in, like, two hours based on our forecast. But it would take me two hours to untangle it. So I just clipped on, clipped on to Brandon's harness, and he towed both of us with his wow. kite. Wow! Nice. <laughs> that wow. was a lot of work for him because he's towing like nine hundred pounds or something. So that's just a lot of strain on your body because the harness is really you're get, getting yanked. Yeah, launching is the hardest because you're standstill and you pull the kite up in the air, and all of a sudden it just rips you super hard forward. But then shortly after, you get ripped backward by the sled. Mm. Once you're moving, it's not bad, but starting is tricky. I imagine your abs like become really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you can. Well, luckily the kite pulls on your harness, so you don't actually have to. You can kind of lean back and relax a little bit. Do you have questions for fun. Yeah, actually, I I mean, I just wanted to know, like, because I've only done kite surfing, so oh. well in the water. But uh, how different is the kite? Is it like the same kite or a completely different kite? So I've heard. I haven't kited in the water. You can mm -hmm. use your water kite on snow. It should work fine. Mm -hmm. well, but my like, kite... Like you pump it up and this works the same way? Oh, oh, the ones I use, you don't pump up. So oh, I've okay. heard that if I tried to water kite with mine, they just turn into an anchor and drop mm -hmm. into the water. It wouldn't yeah, work because, at all. Yeah, the water ones, obviously, like you pump it up, like there is the parts are all full of air. So obviously, it's like if it falls on the water, it like floats. But uh, I guess, yeah, you have like a more like a parachute type kite or something like that, maybe? Or... Yeah, they call it like a foil kite. It's You don't uh, pump anything up. So you could totally use yours on. Yeah, uh, no, like but... Norway's a good spot, I've heard. Yeah, you go kiting. well, mm, no, mm. I was just curious because it's, uh, well, yeah, my one dream is to, uh, I, I told also, to do the Antarctica <laughs> from one yeah. side to another. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd like to do that. <laughs> yeah, but that's something like, you know, it's a lot of time and do you have actually the time? It's like you have to have it perfect. To yeah, we should like... talk afterwards about yeah. got some, so, but, some plans. What, what is your understanding mm. about doing that? Like uh, Chris was saying that you can't go the entire, the, no, nobody's, nobody's ever, done nobody, nobody's done the, the entire way. But we were, we were reading stuff about that and it sounded like some people were claiming like Colin, whatever his name is. Brady. Oh, Brady. Brady? Oh, Brady. Yeah. Or something. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Um, what did he claim? Did he, I think he claimed that he did? It's like done the longest route or something, right, the longest or fastest route. or something. The longest, longest route, the fastest, or no, the but longest. nobody's uh, done the west to east or east to west. Or nobody's done like the actual cross country or cross uh, um, continent. Yeah, right? Borg, Borg Island did it all just unsupported solo back in the nineties. Yes, and that's you what can actually read. see. And there have been some kite traverses. You can look on this website. There's a good map, PEX, P-E-C-S. Yeah. And they'll show you a map of uh, Greenland traverses by kite or by different ways. Yeah. Hmm. There's probably variations that haven't been done. Colin kind of did a like a little out, out and back, not like Borg Osland, but Yeah. Well, that's what we discussed, that uh, the, like most of the routes go to South Pole, and then they might go back where they started, but uh, they don't do like the actual... 
like you know cross oh traverse oh yeah i've yeah, seen yeah. there have been a couple full traverses it's mm. probably hard with the wind though because the wind's usually catabatic meaning it just starts in the middle and goes to the coast yeah so it'd be easy one way hard the other yeah so yeah. i'm not sure exactly well there is well anyways that's something i want to do along the lines of do a trip in there across somehow but i don't know but yeah yeah i'm uh, yeah. i'm also looking into that yeah, <laughs> you just gotta climb all the mountains of the world first. <laughs> well, Vincent, the Antarctica high point, I need to get. Yeah, 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 it'll be on your way there. You can just part. You can just weave that one into the journey. By the way, speaking about climbing mountains in the cold areas, did you these four mountains that you went up these first ascents? How did you pick them, and were they hard? Uh so we picked them because they look like an accessible location for from the kiting the kiting route. Meaning you can kite sort of close to them and then you can manhaul from there. Mm -hmm. So there's only really a, like a narrow ribbon of mountains on the west coast of Greenland. If you get too far inland, the ice sheet just covers them all up. You don't see any mountains. And too too far to the coast is just water. Mm -hmm. So it's a, kind of a very particular spot where you can actually access the peaks from kite skiing. So this was probably the best spot. And then I researched old American Alpine Journal articles and no one had ever climbed in this area. So all the peaks were unclimbed. And so we just right. did the ones that that we could fit in. We had like 10 days we could fit in. <laughs> so cool. I'm just like, oh my God, this is so cool. It's something like, yeah. yeah. I wish that somebody would take me like to this. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> need to just prove Look, myself. She, she doesn't even, she barely weighs 100 pounds. You could have put her like, what's another 100 pounds that you could have carried her No, along? I could carry yeah, her. Yeah, we wouldn't even notice the difference. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't no, notice the difference. I want to like, carry my What's it, you, how many pounds did you said? 700, 900? No, 400. 400. Okay, so you've got 500. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, no. probably wouldn't even notice. Everybody <laughs> has to be so sufficient. Yeah, okay. but, do you not know, hear about that part? <laughs> um, and and uh, so tell us about why you got stuck for like 17 days at the very end. What the hell happened there? Oh, yeah, we got to the edge of the ice cap. It was like early August. We had still like 300 pounds left. So we took three days to shuttle it five miles down to the coast. The packs were like 115 pounds. We didn't weigh them at the time, but they were really heavy. Then we boated to this town and we thought we could fly out. But this is probably the hardest town to fly in and out of in the world, in my experience. Because they will cancel. There's nominally a weekly flight, maybe two a week. And they were just canceling every single one. All just kinds not, of... Just not enough demand? Oh, there's plenty of demand. There's Well, there's no real tourists in this town, but there's a bunch of scientists that are studying glaciology up there and if there's a little bit of bad weather like a little bit of fog they won't land and the takeoff place the takeoff town of lulasat the landing town kanak or the emergency landing town upranavik halfway and then sometimes the plane there's a technical issue sometimes they had to divert the plane to copenhagen or some other place instead this is the lowest priority town so, so did you just eat through all the extra 300 pounds worth of food that you had <laughs> Uh, we actually left it there for a future expedition if we want to go back. And then we just bought food in Greenland or at oh, the grocery really? store there. Really? Yeah, it's basically like a refrigerator there all probably <laughs> September through June. So food will last. So what, what, So what, you're thinking about going back. What would you be doing if you go back? Uh, we want to get the high point. So The high point back. of Greenland? You, never, you didn't do the high point of Greenland? The strip, Eric? No, I, we miss because it's on the, the way the winds blow, it makes it, you have to go basically north to south mm -hmm. to hit the high point. You have to go through the national park and it's very hard to get permission. The whole Northeast quadrant of Greenland is a national park. And like how would they so. know? I mean, like who's out there, some <laughs> ranger out there asking, where's their permit? <laughs> well, there is the serious patrol, the Danish, uh, it's like Danish military on dog sled. They patrol that coast. So oh, you wouldn't really? want to get caught by them. Did you see them? Oh, we well, we weren't on the East Coast this time. But they go up and yeah. down the East Coast. Because there's no real villages there. So they needed to mm. patrol it somehow. Okay. So Plus if you want to prove it, right? Then you have to be like, well, I did it. And if you didn't no, you just take, it, a, take a selfie on the top. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, so, uh, so you're going to have to go back. And part, and you want to like do an expedition so that you hit the high point of Greenland. Yeah, hopefully that's, that's the highest point of Denmark. Yeah, Denmark owns Greenland, so so I got to get to Gunbjorn Field sometime. 
And, and that's the same reason you need to go to South Georgia Island because it's the tallest point of the UK. Yeah, exactly. That's another hard one to get to. That's so cool, though. <laughs> yeah. I just read about it. Oh, my God, I want to go um, there. It's incredible, South Georgia Island. Yeah, everybody is told. I, I, I think I told you this last time, Eric, but I, this guy who's been to about 150 countries, he said his favorite place ever was South Georgia Island. Whoa. I'm saying, I'm saying a lot. Yeah, and um, you can't fly there. You got to take a boat. Yeah. Makes it hard to get to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, looking and it's pretty expensive. Pricey. Yeah, very expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, okay, and so what? Uh, besides your Greenland experience was just monumental. Um, was it harder than you expected or easier? Uh, the delays were more than expected. The kiting, once I got the hang of it, it was a little bit uh, easier than expected. Okay. So I yeah. kited about a week beforehand of uh, that's in it. yeah in British Columbia and Washington and Utah. And you go from like zero to hero pretty quick there mm. once it's super flat open terrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. once you get going, it's, I mean, 25, 30 miles an hour felt easy. That was mm -hmm. that was kind of unexpected. I thought like 100 mm. miles would be a big day, but if the wind was good, 200 was, 150, 200 was kind of normal. Well, yeah. It was a little surprising. And, and how many hours were you going a day? Like uh, from, how many hours were you, because you have to eat and stop and eat and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, like the big days were maybe 14, 15 hours, maybe okay. 200 mile days. And then okay. the less, 100 miles was kind of not too bad, maybe eight hours. Okay, got something it. Something like that. Okay, got it. And so, what's the, so what other things that you've done that's pretty high up on the list, would you say? Uh, that, I just, things... oh, I just surveyed Mount Rainier and I've discovered it's melted about 22 feet since the last survey, which is yeah, kind of a big crazy. deal here. Yeah. And the summit is now in a different location. The summit used to be this ice dome, and now it's this rocky spot on the I different part of the rim. I remember reading that on your Instagram and your whole post about that. That's crazy. So it's just, I mean, it's a volcano, so it's it's shifting and moving and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, this is mostly probably climate change related. The mm -hmm. ice dome just melting down. Mm-hmm. There's probably, I mean, it is a volcano. Like, that would be a bigger issue if the the rocks were changing there. Hopefully that mm. doesn't happen soon. So it's just, it's just pure ice melt. Yeah. And it's kind a of, lot. yeah, it's a lot, 20 something feet. Like the guides yeah. were telling me that the, the summit's gone. We don't know. We don't know what's happened, but no one, it's really hard to measure. Cause you got to haul up like 20, 30 pounds of serving equipment and hang out there for a couple of hours, take a bunch of measurements. Mm -hmm. you can't just like whip your phone out and see what it says. It doesn't, really but I, th it. I thought you, but you did bring, that your gadgets yeah that's what i that's why these measurements are very trustworthy right because i'm borrowing these like serving gadgets the the professional equipment from the university i teach at right it's it's pretty hard to get but i i can borrow Which it university it. seattle university got it yeah that's, that's amazing you got to you get to do that as as part of research <laughs> yeah it's great i don't need to buy the equipment <laughs> exactly <laughs> Okay, and then, uh, so what do you got slated for the rest of 2024 and into 2025? I'm doing Highlights. more. I got a grant from American Alpine Club to survey mountains affected by climate change. So I'm going to survey those around Washington, see which other ones have melted down. Such as Baker or something? Yeah, I just went to Baker uh, a couple weeks ago. That one, the saddle's melted 16 feet in the past two years. It's quite a lot. So I got a couple other ones, Liberty Cap, El Dorado. Um, yeah, the winter I've got some trip in South America and try to do some more serving in Columbia. Any other high points that you're on the short list? Uh, so the Columbia high point, it's unknown, which is the true summit oh, to 18,000 foot mountains. They've been closed for the past like 40 years, but we got permission. So we're going to try to, I'm going to try to survey which one's higher, bring my equipment up there. So obviously you got to go up both. Yeah. And one's technical and one's non-technical they're both glaciated so that'll mm. be kind of interesting got it and so what what uh, time of year are you going to do that uh december got it that's like the dry season down there okay so it's coming up pretty quick yeah i gotta sharpen my surveying skills so i'm ready for that <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yes, for, yes. Right? Well, we're in Colombia exactly, and uh, what means how how technical is technical? <laughs> oh, it's in northern Colombia. It's uh, it's it's actually kind of close to the coast. You oh, can probably okay. see the ocean from the top. It's kind of surprising. 
And the technical one, it's like two pitches of maybe mid fifth class rock, maybe mixed climbing. Like from what I've heard, I don't know, maybe M1, M2. Okay. And then the other one's more of a glacier climb. Okay. North Columbia. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Eric, you live an amazing life. I'm really uh, excited always to talk to you. Always, It's always fun. I mean, in some ways, what you do, it's so monumental and so underappreciated because, I mean, that's one thing about, you know, yeah, in the climbing community, we know a lot about things, but, you know, 99% of people have no fucking clue about what people are doing and how hard it is. And mm. But in the end, and you're not doing it for money or, you know, mm. it's just, it's not even glory because nobody even cares. Nobody knows in the most part. You got to do it for your own love. Uh, mm. But I just want you to know that that you've got at least two fans. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> oh, you guys do cool stuff too. Yeah, Driving yeah, around yeah. Africa for eight years, doing K2. <laughs> no, it's more about like how, like I think the way how you do it. It's not about like, well, also what you do, but it's also like just the purity behind it or like just doing it for yourself instead of like, Glory and fame. And well, yeah, or like book deals. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it's I, I I appreciate that a lot. Or like, I mean, my dream would be to, or like, I want to start climbing more without oxygen. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm still good with oxygen as well. I'm not gonna be like you know. I like oh, I've used place. it too. I used it on Kanchenjunga. Yeah, well, right. yeah, I know, but uh, you're forced to. I almost did lots of without, but I just yeah, but I was only acclimatized once so i just didn't i just wanted to go for it then mm -hmm. and chris why don't you uh as we wrap up yeah. what tells about your kind of dreams for the in 2024 2025 well this year i think my climbing ventures are On climbed <laughs> <laughs> well i just you know it's like financial and yeah it's incredibly expensive this stuff i mean some of the mountains well with the way how I have been going and I just don't have like a group of people who I can just go and climb, I guess. So I have to go with expeditions, mm -hmm. but, or that's what I've had to do or that's mm -hmm. what I've done. But well, for next year, yeah, my dream is still to go back to Kanch. And uh, well, then there was a talk about Makalu. Uh, maybe I can do something. Have you done Makalu? No. Yeah. Well, these are the mountains I would like to climb. Makalu is another 8,000 meter peak. Yeah, so for me, it's like, uh, well, Kanchenjunga is always in my heart, which is almost like... Why, why? I don't know. This is a mountain I've always wanted to climb, and it would be nice one, two, three, because I've done one and two, and mm. I, I don't have like the like the goal to do all 14 yeah. or whatever, but mm. uh, plus in Estonia, nobody's climbed it. You know, mm. I do have some kind of, you know, drive <laughs> to yeah. be first or something. Mm. But uh, plus, I like the mountain, you know, I, I thought it was cool. I think the summit would be a bit of a more uh, challenge than mm. like a longer day uh, than, I don't know, lots of for like three hours. It's kind of like, well, you know, cool. Mm. <laughs> Let's get on with something else. Um, but um, yeah, I think and I would like to do more climbing like on my own instead of like last time we did it also only with uh, me and my Sherpa. Well, but we still carried our own stuff, you know, so we shared everything. So. I just want to be more self-sufficient and become stronger and more experienced. So the more I can climb like this way, just without big team behind me, I think that will be my goal in the future and just for the future years. And well, Makalu as well. So either like Makalu first as a acclimatization and then go straight to Kanch. So that would be like a next year's spring plan if, if I get lucky. There you go. That sounds fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time uh, to update us, uh, Eric, and I uh, really wish you the best for your upcoming adventures for 2024, 2025. And we will, I hope to have you back again and give us, uh, I love the story in Greenland. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so it's cool. Phenomenal. And you're going to be, you're going to be going back, right? Hopefully. And, uh, well, the food is there, you know, you can't waste it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you give me the GPS location, I might go and scrounge. Uh oh. <laughs> Buried under some rocks. <laughs> <laughs> all right take care awesome. okay thanks yeah. see ya and that ends this episode of the wander learn podcast where we explore travel technology and transformation if you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we've talked about go to wanderlearn.com and click on this episode if you'd like to connect with me just remember f tap on that's my first initial and my last name 
ftapon is always my social media username. My website is ftapon.com. Do you want to leave me an anonymous voicemail where you can make a comment or ask a question? Then go to speakpipe.com slash ftapon. Furthermore, if you'd like to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash ftapon. That's where you can pick up some remarkable rewards for as little as $2 a month. Now, five quick favors. Number one, subscribe to the Wander Learn podcast. Two, download it. Three, share it. Four, review it. And five, sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. Our theme music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn.